Well, good morning, everybody. Hope you are well on this Tuesday morning. Um, let's go ahead and just get started. But before we do, um, let's, let's recap. So last, um, I guess it was last Wednesday, we learned about Tokugawa, and it was a two-part story of Hideyoshi and Tokugawa. Tokugawa had, had assumed control of Japan and became shogun. And at, once he did that, he enacted feudalism throughout Japan, where it's, it's a class system. So you're born into a class and you stay that way. He also made sweeping changes. And one of the big ones was he, well, he banned Christianity in favor of Confucianism. But the big, big thing is he shut down Japan um, and allowed no one in or out. And that was the last thing that we, we wrote down. For 250 years, um, the Tokugawa's controlled Japan. So from about 1600 uh, to roughly 250 years after that, a Tokugawa was a shogun. And they did that by, uh, before the Tokugawa leader would, would die, they would pass on the power to their son, their offspring. And that way there's a peaceful transfer of power, which allowed this dynasty to occur. And this was huge. But the biggest thing that Tokugawa did, like I said, was he shut Japan down uh, and allowed no one in or out. He didn't allow any uh, people to come visit, no trading. If you got too close, uh, you were killed. Um, anything that was non-Japanese was banned. Things like, uh, well, obviously religion, uh, culture. Uh, if you remember muskets that the Portuguese had introduced, and, they, and Hideyoshi had used those in warfare, he banned those in favor of the sword. It, it was very traditional Jap uh, Japanese. And he banned this for 250 years. Okay, well, he banned it. He, he didn't know how long it's going to last for 250 years. So uh, to best illustrate this, I'm going to tell you a quick story. And um, I'm going to ruin a movie for you and hope that's okay. But um, there's a, a director called M. Night Shyamalan, and that's his name. He uh, is most known for his movies that they kind of have a twist. They're not horror movies ne necessarily, but they're kind of creepy at times, and his most famous movie was his first one called The Sixth Sense. If you haven't seen it, uh, check with your parents, but watch it with your parents. Um, it's not a horror movie, but it definitely kind of fits in that creepy genre, but there's a big twist at the end, and all of his movies have these twists. Well, I'm going to ruin one of his movies for you because it fits perfectly. It's a movie called The Village, and um, in the, the concept of The Village is this. There's this village set probably in the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, and they're completely self-contained. They have all the food they need, they grow their own food, they have a water source, they have everything they need, they're completely self-contained, and they never leave this village. And they're surrounded, the village is surrounded on all four sides by this forest, and the kids grew up believing that there is this red wicker looking monster that lives in the forest, and if you get too close or too go, if you go too far into the forest, the, the this monster, creepy looking, wickery looking thing comes out and it scares you and you're supposed to stay out of the woods. So they grow up like this and that's their culture. There's um, a young lady in this group, uh, This you know, she's in the, in the village, she's probably in her, I don't know, late teens, early 20s, I forget how old she is, but she's blind, but she has a unique blindness where she sees like heat sources and colors. She's not blind blind, she can see heat or something like that so um throughout the movie there's a boy who gets sick and he needs medicine and the village elders realize they don't have the medicine in their village to save him but they also know that there's medicine that is this outside of the village and but they don't ever leave the village so they finally decide one one of the young men says i will volunteer i'll go to the next village and risk my way through the forest so that um you know, I can save my friend. They're like, absolutely not. So they have this meeting, and they decide to send this blind girl through the forest. And, and everyone else, the, the the adults know why, understand, but the, all the kids are like, why in the world are they sending her, and blah, 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 blah. So she goes through the forest, and it's this real kind of intense thing, and she's trying to get through the forest. And so she's, again, she can't see like we, we see. She sees in these heat sources or something. So she um, we see her going through the forest, and she comes to the end, and by the way, I'm skipping a whole movie here. This is the very end. But she comes to the end of the forest, and there's like these big branches hanging down. She kind of parts her branches, the branches, and she comes into a clearing. And she's made it through the forest safely. And it's like, oh, okay. So she starts to walk, and the camera pans out, 
and we see this fence and it's a chain link fence alongside of a road and at first you're like oh, okay whatever and then you realize wait a minute this is set in the 17 or 1800s they wouldn't have chain link fence and there wouldn't be a modern paved road and all of a sudden an suv pulls up and she gets in they pick her up she they put her in the car they take her to a medical facility they give her the medicine they need they put her back in the car, they take her back to this spot, and they say, walk that way, and she goes back to the forest and goes home. And you realize, as the viewer, that this vi village is not set in the 17 or 1800s, it's set in modern times, but this village is completely self-contained. So the backstory that we learn then is that the people who started this village had all had some type of trauma in their life. I think someone lost a spouse to sickness, I think someone lost a... A, a loved one to a car accident or something and they were just kind of fed up with with life and so they had a wealthy friend who owned this property and uh, they were given this property to create this village to live completely self-contained away from the rest of the world away from all the trials and all the troubles and the this, this strife and the the memories of of their past lives and they had families that grew up there and they, they, the adults knew that there was a world out there but the kids did not because they raised the kids as if this was the only world they had. And, um, and that's why they sent the blind girl out, because then she didn't see anything. She didn't see what life was like there. Blew my mind. Awesome. And I'm sorry to spoil the movie for you, but that's that. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is because that's exactly, to a point, what happened in Japan. In the year 1600, whatever culture was like in the year 1600, even further back, Tokugawa shut it down and said... This is it. And I think the last lesson, last Wednesday, I said, what I want you to think about is what would happen if the United States shut down in 1776 and we still lived like we did then, assuming that the rest of the world changed exactly like it is now, um, which you can't because the United States drove a lot of innovation. But you get the idea. If the whole world was just as it is now, but, but the United States was still living like we were in 1776, and all of a sudden we opened up life, would that be a radical shock to us? Absolutely. And even though it's 1600 to 1850 and they didn't have a lot of the things in 1850 that we're used to now, it was still a huge culture shock. So Japan was literally that village shut down for 250 years. They didn't let anybody in, didn't let anybody out. They had no contact or very little contact with anything else. And if you left the island um, by accident, like you got shipwrecked or whatever and you got picked up by other people, you were generally killed when you got back into Japan because you saw the outside world, what life was like. And so um, that's where the culture we're setting into. So today, you look at the lesson here, you see Matthew Perry. Uh, this Many years ago, this made this was a more of a joke because if you're a Friends fan, which I am a huge Friends fan, um, Matthew Perry plays Chandler on Friends. So that back when I used to do this a long time ago and Friends was on TV, everyone knew Matthew Perry. Not everyone knows that name anymore, but it's actually Commodore Perry, but uh, here we go. All right, so... And Japan enjoyed more than 250 years of relative peace and stability between 1600 and 1850, roughly. The country had been well organized by the shogun, Yasu Tokugawa, whose family continued to control the government generation after generation. I already described that. But many of the Tokugawas that followed Yasu were not strong leaders. They gave many of the responsibilities of government to administrators and daimyos. Now, they could spend more time enjoying their wealth and privilege, but the Tokugawas lost their respect and fear that Iyasu had once commanded. We have seen this theme so many times. The emperors were powerful. Over time, they gave up their power because they just didn't really want to do it. That created that void, which we saw in Yoritomo's story, where they needed a military leader. That That's what created the term shogun. We saw after that, the shoguns gave up their power. They just kind of wanted to whatever, and it, they created more strife again, which led to Hideyoshi. We see the Tokugawa. Yasu was a strong leader, but his descendants did not care too much about leading. They just wanted to count their wealth and and be called shogun. So this was not, um, just, again, I've said this before multiple times in class, just because mom or dad is good at something doesn't mean you're going to be good at something. It doesn't mean your kids and doesn't mean your grandkids and all the way down. Just because they're a great leader does not mean that just because you know they're really good doesn't mean it has to stay in the family. But... They did. They lost the respect and fear. Even though Yasu is not a great person, he did command respect. So, Japan remains closed. 
During the Tokugawa shogunate, Japan remained closed to foreign trade and influences. Except for the port at Nagasaki, Japan had no way to know about the progress in the rest of the world. Japanese citizens were forbidden to leave the country. The Tokugawa government ordered that no ocean-going ships were to be built. Foreigners attempting to land on o Japanese soil, even by accident, were often punished by death. The Japanese favored and developed those things that were Japanese, such as the tea ceremony, the kabuki, and no theater, but the government discouraged and outlawed those things introduced by foreigners. Muskets, I already mentioned this, muskets once banned by the Portuguese were now banned. The sword was once again the weapon of choice for the samurai. The Christian religion also remained banned in favor of Buddhism, Shinto, and Confucianism. Here is the big, the big line here. Japan progressed little in the 250 years of Tokugawa rule, preserving a society like no other on earth. Okay, so that's it. So you can pause here if you need to to, get, to write the whole line down, but that's the important thing. Japan progressed little in the 250 years of Tokugawa rule, preserving a society like no other on earth. Now, here comes Perry. A time for surprise and awakening for the Japanese occurred in 1853. Late that year, Commodore Matthew Perry, an American, sailed into a Japanese harbor with his four steam-powered warships. These modern vessels were equipped with massive guns of the latest design. All right, here's the thing. For 250 years, Japan shuts down. They don't allow anybody in or out. All of a sudden, here comes these four steam-powered ships. This may not seem like a big deal, but steam power was new. It was uh, allowed for bigger ships. So these ships just sailed across the ocean. Remember, no ocean-going ships were built in Japan for a couple hundred years. Now these steam-powered ships come in with cannons and guns, these big things, and they're flying the flag of a country that Japan had no idea existed. Because this is 1850. Japan closed in 1600, before the pilgrims set sail from Great Britain. Okay, if that tells you time perspective. Before the pilgrims, Japan shut down. Now, all of a sudden, there's this new country, the United States, that comes flying in, well, sailing in, flying their flag, and um, they're very powerful. Japan's been around for a few thousand years. Who is this little country that's been around for less than 100, right? So the Japanese had developed no new weapons in the past 250 years, and they knew they were powerless to resist these modern weapons of war. Although Perry had no authority, authority to, excuse me, to use the guns against the Japanese, the show of power shocked the Tokugawa government. Perry's warship frightened the Japanese, but his mission was actually one of peace. He wanted Japan to once again open its doors, at least to American sailors. Perry brought a friendly, friendly letter from the President of the United States and presented it to the Tokugawa government along with Western gifts that demonstrated the progress of the outside world. So Perry came as a peaceful mission. He didn't want to uh, come as a uh, stroll in and go, hey, we're here to take you over. They could have. Absolutely they could have. Sure, the, the, the samurai fought off Kublai Khan's army, um, but that was an equal fight, right? Swords for swords, spears for spears for spears. This was cannons, and, and, and mod, at that time, like, you know, rifles, modern at that time, versus spears and bows and arrows. No, no contest, right? So, um, but that wasn't the idea. So he brings a letter from the president, we want to open up trade. He brings gifts from the outside world. Here is a couple of those gifts. The Japanese were essentially or especially fascinated with a sewing machine and a miniature railroad. Commodore Perry stayed only ten days and sailed off, promising to return in the spring. They saw a sewing machine. Um, it was a hand, you know, foot foot uh, powered sewing machine. It wasn't electric or anything, but it was still a modern marvel. But they also brought model model trains. Um, imagine if um, if uh, you saw a model train and it had a little bit of electricity and it ran around this track like oh my gosh and then you could say you know what this is just a model like what do you mean a model it's like well back in the you know western world and modern world these trains are all over like people can get in them and take you from one place to another like wow let me blow you away right because they had no idea anything like this resisted but perry said listen i gotta go home but i'll be back in the spring when it warms up so commodore perry returned to japan in 1854 this time with his 10, 10 steam-powered warships. So from the time of the winter to spring, he said he'll come back. And I'm, I'm imagining that there is some uh, samurai outlook guy looking out uh, over the horizon, uh, waiting for uh, him to return. And he stands there and goes, hey, where's Perry? And then he sees him come over the horizon and goes, oh, there you are, Perry. <laughs> you see what it did? That's good, huh? Yeah, okay. Best cartoon Love it. 
Perry. By the way, did you ever notice that, like, Dr. Doofenshmirtz isn't that evil? All of his plans were not that evil. Anyway, okay. But um, Perry's return was once again friendly, and the Japanese were courteous to him. They had spent the past few months thinking about how far behind the other nations Japan had fallen. Plans to open Japan to ideas of the Western world were discussed by the shogun and the emperor. The Japanese, proud of their past, never being conquered by another country, knew that a change had to come. A treaty was signed by Japan with the United States, and it provided that shipwrecked U.S. sailors would be treated kindly. So, so they realized that they had to um, modernize. They had to, they had to become better. They were. They could have easily been taken over if, not to stand on a U.S. soapbox here, but many other countries could have sailed in and would have taken them over. They would have conquered Japan and turned it into another country, part of their other country or whatever. The United States is not an imperialist nation um, where they go out and conquer other people. We've talked about imperialism before. It's where you go out and you conquer other lands to add to your own. That's not the United States mantra anymore. And um, and so they said, "We're well, listen. We're, we don't want it. To, we don't want you to become the United States. We want you to be your own country, but we want you to open up." And so the Japanese knew they needed to do that. These sailors, the United States sailors, would not be beheaded like other people were. So that was nice. The U.S. ships could dock and purchase provisions in Japan, and a representative of the United States government could live in Japan. We call this an ambassador. So we set up an ambassador to the United States, or from the United States to Japan. With this treaty, Perry had successfully opened the doors between Japan and the modern world. So this is a big deal because now Japan has opened up. And what we're going to see now is uh, a massive shift in Japan. They are going to realize that we need to change, and we need to change fast. We, like I said a minute ago, the Japanese realized we could have easily been taken over. We could have easily had, um, had this... We could have been conquered, but they were not, okay, thankfully. But uh, one more thing has to happen here for the story to continue. The powerful nations, the foreign nations had experienced an amazing degree of development in the past 250 years, while Japan, with its doors closed to the outside world, had changed very little. The Japanese knew that something had to be done. For the past 2,000 years, Japan had never been conquered by another nation. I told you, this is a few weeks ago, after they defeated Kublai Khan, that, remember I used the word divine land a lot, divinely created land, divine, divine, divine. They really felt that their land was created by the gods, it was protected by the gods, and it was for the purpose of the gods. And so they... They knew that for two, over 2,000 years, they had never been conquered because they had been protected by the gods and that their land was special. And they knew that they could have easily been conquered at this point. So the proud Japanese recalled the divine beginnings of their country, the Jammu, descendants of the gods. All the emperors of Japan had been relatives of Jammu, and no one wanted that line of royalty to end now. So the Tokugawa government could not decide what should be done. So finally, Emperor Meiji, who was the emperor, a very young emperor at this time, he took control of the government, ending the Tokugawa reign of power. He said, listen, Tokugawa, enough is enough. We're in this because of you. Not only did your great-great-great-grandfather, Ayasu, shut Japan down and keep us away from everything else, but you guys have not been leading us well. You've not modernized us. and We could have easily lost Japan. So you guys are done. You're out. The emperor's back in town. I'm taking over. So he ends not only the Tokugawa reign of power, he ends the shogun's reign of power, and he gets rid of the whole culture of the samurai and the whole feudalistic system. And that's it. He's done. Because he, they, they realize this is not the way a modern country lives. Okay? So that's that. So that's going to lead us to the next story tomorrow, um, which will lead us to a very big, huge turning point that many of you might be a little more familiar with now because we're getting into modern times. Uh, we'll talk about World War II tomorrow. All right. So that is the story today of of um, how the, J the Japanese opened up their culture to uh, the rest of the world after being shut down for so long. OK, you guys know the drill, the quiz, six points, six questions. Many of you are doing really well. I want to remind some of you, there's a couple people who are getting lower scores. You can take this twice. And let's just say, like, let's say you take it twice and you don't do well. Email me. Say, hey, can I take it again? I don't know if I can open it up specifically to you to take it again, but I can quiz you through email. I want you to do well in this. So don't don't take a low score and just let it settle, okay? But um, make sure you get that in. And um, 
Again, do it today if you can. I won't put it in the computer probably till Monday when it's actually due, but um, or at least if I do, I put it. I won't become missing until Monday. All right. The access code for the quiz today is there, two two eight MP for Matthew Perry, and um, that's that. All right, guys, have a good day. I'll see you tomorrow.